Welcome to Top Whiskeys. Today we are doing a whole series of videos in Nula Bar with Blue about Irish whiskey. We're going to answer lots of questions. We're going to go through all kinds of interesting stories about Irish whiskey. Can you tell us a bit about Nula Bar? So the idea behind the Nula Bar was to bring everything Irish. So we have an Irish restaurant upstairs. Uh, we have Irish crisps, which don't get me started on potatoes. <laughs> I mean, I don't get it, but the Irish people will be happy to know we have potatoes. Right there. Just right there, yeah. Wall, wall, wall of potatoes. Wall, wall of tato. <laughs> and we also have a lot of Irish whiskey, so the idea was to bring Irish whiskey to a very accessible setup. So something quite laid back, something really chilled, but with a very premium collection. So also not what you expect from a whiskey bar. Well, chill. let's take a look at some of the whiskey. I have to admit, walking in, the thing that gets me is that massive bottle of Jameson. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen a bottle that big. <laughs> it's quite cool. I want the same in my bedroom. <laughs> you actually can install it. It doesn't cost that much money. So yeah, that's, uh, that's my next DIY. Is it like two liters, three liters? Four liters. Four liters of Jameson. Yeah, four liters. Okay. And I think just to install it, like the whole thing is about like 60 pounds. So it's not that much. Yeah, so all you need to do is just get a rack and then yeah, four exactly. liters of Jameson. Jameson, yeah. You're sorted. yeah. As you do, you know, right. in your living room. Yeah. I know a lot about Jameson, and when I think of Irish whiskey, that big thing is what I think about. But what else should I know about Irish whiskey? I think because currently Irish whiskey is on a massive revival, and that's why people should start to really mm. get interested in it, because there's some really cool stuff happening. So they went from about 15 years ago having three distilleries left, due to their quite dramatic history, mm -hmm. to now having 24 distilleries commissioned in the past 10 years. Wow. So you can imagine to build a distillery and then start making your whiskey and then start aging it, it takes a good while before you can actually launch your own products. But there's going to be a lot of Irish whiskey being launched all simultaneously in the next like yeah, 10 years. Wow. So having so many distilleries starting together and having to market themselves together as mm. well means that it's going to be a big um, a big look for anything modern, anything forward thinking, uh, trying to all differentiate themselves from each other and trying to really yeah, create like a new image for whiskey overall. When most people think about Irish whiskey, they do think of that massive Jameson yeah. and they think of whiskey that's been distilled three times and doesn't have a whole lot of flavor. I don't want to sound offensive. <laughs> no. Not that I don't like it's Irish true, whiskey. That's what a lot of people think. What would you say to someone who comes in and says, all Irish whiskey tastes like Jameson and is just flavored vodka? I'd say that there's like such a wide range of flavors in terms of whiskey and people are so caught up in the marketing that the first question I ask is, what do you drink? Mm -hmm. And then when they tell me, I drink Glenfiddich, I drink Brooklady, I drink like heavily pitted whiskey, I drink bourbons, whatever they drink, then I try to uh, make a little blind test for them and just go towards flavors and make them realize, like do like a three or four whiskey blind test mm -hmm. to make them realize how each whiskey is so different from one another. Yeah. And how it doesn't all just taste like Jameson. Say someone is a Speyside fan and they drink a lot of Glenfiddich. What sort of Irish whiskeys might they be drawn towards? Green Spot is often my starting point because it's very light, it's very easy drinking, yet it has a lot of flavor. So it's a lot of very approachable flavors. So I'm talking honey, apples, just mm. orchard fruits all around. Um, it's also quite an interesting price point because it's at 35 pound. I personally think it's the best 35 pound you could be spending on a bottle of whiskey. Yeah. It's someone, I've never had anyone just sending it back and <laughs> saying, I don't like Green Spot. Some people may not be utterly impressed, so it may not be their favorite whiskey, but everybody's quite happy drinking it. So okay. that's where I usually start. And for people who like quite lighter styles of whiskey, Green Spot is Yeah, point. Green Spot is a good one. So what would be like on the opposite end? So if someone likes a Talisker or they like an Isla whiskey? Connemara, as far as I'm aware, is the only whiskey in Ireland that is actually peated. There's an other whiskey or other whiskeys that are currently trying to mess around with uh, peated casks. Mm -hmm. So that will impart a bit of a smoke to the whiskey, but the whiskey itself is not peated. Connemara is peated, and we have two expressions here. We have the 12-year-old and the Turf Moor. The Turf Moor is a heavily pitted one. It's 50 ppm, so we're talking like heavily pitted. We're talking Lefroigs, we're talking Ardbegs. Wow. That level of peat. Um, so that's for the like yeah. hardcore peat. I never would have expected that from Irish whiskey. No, uh, this is a very recent launch. So again, like Irish whiskey, every single day is trying to launch something new, something different, something people may not expect from them. Uh, and that's why I think it's really cool. Yeah. And the 12-year-old is a little bit lighter. 
and it's very easy drinking. So I think it's a good start if it's the earlier in the night and you don't necessarily want that peat to just get stuck to your palate all night. You want something to start with, you still like peated whiskies, can drink that and then it's not, it's not yeah. going to mess around in your palate all night. Got the light whiskies, this nice space side, we've got the peated whiskey. Yeah. What would sort of be in between? in between? This is where I'd go. So, Red Breast 12. Uh, Red Breast as a brand is known for it being very heavy in sherry. So they're quite good, I think, for bourbon drinkers because they like sweeter style of spirits. When they arrive to Red Breast, they will find that sweetness. Mm -hmm. Although it's very different types of sweetness. Um, you've got a lot of sherries, you've got a lot of berries, a lot of chocolate, mandarin kind of flavors. Uh, so that's a good point. Then you have Glendalock 13. They, uh, it's, it's quite funny, they are finished in a Mizunara cask. So Mizunara is Japanese oak. Japanese oak is quite rare. First of all, because Japan is quite a small <laughs> island, so they don't have that much oak. Yeah. And most of their oak they use in their own whiskey, which is quite recent. Japanese oak is also not great for making barrels out of, mm -hmm. because it doesn't grow straight. It's uh, very porous, so it leaks a lot. It's very hard to work with, and it can be very um, high in tannins. So not always the best for uh, whiskey maturation. And for a very long time, like they started using it a lot in the 50s, after the Second World War, for political reasons, they couldn't get their hands on import, imported barrels. So they thought, okay, we're going to make barrels out of our own oak, and realized that there was a lot of challenges after huh. it. Um, and they didn't really like it. They thought that Japanese oak was inferior. They thought that you know it wasn't really well marketed. And it's only recently, like in the past 20, 25 years, especially Centauri has been pushing Mizunara oak and saying, no, this is our oak and we can make let's something Let's be proud great. of it. Yeah, exactly. Let's be proud of it and we can make something great out of it. And it's got like a very distinct flavor. Uh -huh. There's very few distilleries outside of Japan who have actually used Mizunara oak because it's very expensive. As I said, it's quite rare. Japan doesn't necessarily sell a lot of it uh, for the import export market. And Glendalock has put their hands on a few barrels. Uh, which I think Glendalock is also a good example of what I love about Irish whiskey. That I've been following the brand for the past couple of years, and they have re uh, they have redone their packaging. They have redone also all of their expressions. The 13 years old used to be only bourbon cask, and only recently have they launched their Mizunara finish. So it's quite cool to see the evolution of a brand that starts quite small and is going bigger and bigger. And it's one of the, especially their gin, we get asked a lot about. Um, so yeah, cool. really, really nice one. And this one you're going to get a lot of honey, um, a lot of like Christmas cake kind of flavors. Ooh, and then awesome. the last one would be uh, Method and Madness. Their whole range, so it's a three uh, expression range. They have a single pot still, a single grain and a single malt. And that's a bit showcasing this is everything we can do. This mm -hmm. is like the whole spectrum of Irish whiskey. You go from very light grain whiskey, you go from a malt, which most people know about, and then you go to pot still, which is the traditional Irish type, like red breast and green spot, all pot still whiskies. So what sort of still is this made in? It's made from a pot still, but mm. the thing with pot still whiskey, uh, yeah, whiskey terminology can be a little bit confusing, is that it's made from malted barley and raw barley. So it's also great when people come in and say, oh, I like a single malt. and it, Honestly, it doesn't really mean much, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but it's quite easy to target them towards pot still because it's something they've never tried before, but it's still made from 100% barley. So it's a flavor that they're not necessarily used to, but it's not too far off what they usually okay. drink. Um, and that's a very traditional Irish style. So back in the days, the British Empire tried to get um, a lot of control in the Irish culture, as we know, and part of that was putting heavy taxes. So they taxed malt and the Irish whiskey maker decided to get around it by putting a blend of malted barley and raw barley. The fermentation could still work, the fermentation process could still uh, kick off, so they could still make alcohol out of it, but then they would pay half less tax, and you get a different flavor profile. Ah, it. I'm convinced. Cool. There's, there's a lot to Irish whiskey <laughs> that I didn't realize. In this series, we're going to be talking about all these different Irish whiskeys, mm -hmm. uh, so let's do sort of a deep dive on, onto each one. Cool. Okay, let's get started. Thanks for watching our first video in this series of videos about Irish whiskey. Remember to click the subscribe button and watch the rest of the series. The next video we're going to be doing is about Green Spot.